Fair Review, print speaking to the blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Kuhn Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at cunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. This is from the Herald Scotland of Wednesday the 9th of October 2024 from the Voices section. It's time to stop abusers like Al-Fayed using law to silence victims. This article is by Struan Stevenson. The unravelling horror story of alleged rape and sexual abuse involving the former Harrods owner Mohammed Al-Fayed contains a familiar trademark. Al-Fayed used non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, to gag victims of his sexual crimes. NDAs seem to be the weapon of choice for the super-rich and for big international corporations who want to hide something. They are frequently used to silence whistleblowers and to provide protection from accusations of sexual or racial abuse, harassment and workplace bullying. NDAs can have legitimate objectives, such as protecting personal privacy or ensuring that confidential business information is not disclosed to a third party. But under the guise of these genuine concerns, the intrinsically secretive nature of NDAs allows their cynical exploitation by sexual predators, bullies and even corporate crooks and must surely call into question the use and enforceability of such agreements in these contexts. Although, under UK law, NDAs cannot be used to prevent someone from cooperating with a criminal investigation or reporting misconduct, they often are. The fear of protracted legal action and potential crippling costs is often enough to secure the ongoing silence of even the most ill-treated or physically molested victim. This was clearly the case with the dozens of women, some as young as 15, who claimed they were raped or physically assaulted by the Egyptian tycoon, Mohammed Al-Fayed, when they worked at Harrods or accompanied their monster boss on trips to his luxury apartment building in London, the Ritz Hotel in Paris, his opulent villas around the world, and his superyacht. Having signed NDAs as a condition of service, they felt unable to reveal the abuse that Al-Fayed had inflicted on them until after his death, aged 94, last year. He is just the most recent multi-millionaire or billionaire to have ruthlessly exploited NDAs for predatory purposes. In America, Harvey Weinstein, the disgraced Hollywood producer, used NDAs widely to silence victims of his sexual misconduct. Following one of the most high-profile cases that contributed to the Me Too movement, 70-year-old Weinstein is now serving a 23-year jail sentence for rape and sexual assault. The American rapper P. Diddy insisted on watertight agreements being signed by his close friends and colleagues, effectively gagging them for up to 70 years. The rapper's homes in Los Angeles and Miami were recently raided by the Department of Homeland Security in an investigation tied to alleged sex trafficking concerns. Also in America, there has been a public outcry following revelations that private hospitals have forced patients who have won medical malpractice cases to sign NDAs so that they cannot harm the hospital's reputation by disclosing the negligence 
or medical ineptitude they have suffered. Even our own NHS has used NDAs to settle disputes involving whistleblowers and claimants, often related to workplace bullying, harassment or discrimination, while in the EU, the European Commission has used NDAs when dealing with whistleblowers or departing staff to ensure confidentiality around internal processes or sensitive information. Protecting and supporting whistleblowers through the law and improved HR practices will ultimately enhance legitimate business activity. When the Volkswagen emission scandal came to light in 2015, which cost the company billions of pounds, it was noted then that there was a remarkable absence of whistleblowing. There has to be mechanisms put in place that make it more rewarding to call out wrongdoing than to keep it secret. Since the Me Too scandal, NDAs have been viewed as legal instruments that attempt to conceal misconduct. Debates about their ethical implications are now commonplace. Some EU member states are considering legislation to limit their use and enforceability in these contexts. There is a growing awareness that NDAs or gagging orders that force a person to observe long-term or even permanent silence, even if the release of the information they have could be in the public interest, should be banned. Such confidentiality agreements are a, an extremely powerful legal tool that, if used unscrupulously, particularly against vulnerable people who may not be aware of what's entailed, can have serious consequences. According to a BBC report in 2020, around one-third of UK universities at that time employed NDAs to ring-fence student grievances and resolve sexual harassment complaints although many believed that the existence of these agreements simply perpetuated the abusive behaviour. Students whose claims of sexual assault were settled by the universities, sometimes with a financial payment, were often made to sign an NDA to protect the institution's reputation. Scotland's universities have been united behind a position never to use NDAs or confidentiality clauses in cases of harassment since 2019. Meanwhile, in August this year, the Office for Students, the OFS, announced new requirements for universities in England to protect students from harassment and sexual misconduct, including a ban on NDAs, which came into force on September the 1st. So, bit by bit, the system is being improved and reformed. All the recent high-profile cases involving NDAs have served to make the public deeply wary of their ethical legitimacy. Surely it is not beyond the wit and wisdom of our legislators in London and Edinburgh to come up with a system that enables NDAs to continue to be used for purely commercial or business purposes while outlawing their exploitation by predators and rich criminals. What is essential is that NDAs must never again be allowed to silence whistleblowers or women who have been sexually abused or people who have suffered discrimination in the workplace. That article was by Struan Stevenson. This is from the Herald Scotland of Wednesday the 9th of October 2024, from the Voices section. The leader who makes the Reverend I. M. Jolly look upbeat. This article is by Ian McConnell. To say that Sir Keir Starmer has made Ricky Fulton's Reverend I Am Jolly character look upbeat would not be too much of a stretch. And at least the Reverend Jolly delivered some laughs. The downbeat demeanour when it has come to the economy and public finances from Sir Keir and his cabinet colleagues, including Chancellor Rachel Reeves and Secretary of State for Scotland, Ian Murray, 
is a serious business. It is, of course, impossible to divine the precise effect of miserable mood music from political leaders on the investment and spending decisions of businesses and consumers. However, the attitude of Sir Keir and his colleagues and the Prime Minister's warnings about tough choices are hardly going to help. They would seem likely to damage confidence, and it is hard to conceive that what we have heard so far from the new Labour government will have put much of a spring in anyone's step. It has certainly not gone down well with some of the electorate, with polls showing Sir Keir's approval ratings have plummeted in the months since his July 4th general election victory. Sir Keir continues to strike what seems to be exactly the same tone as that chosen by erstwhile Conservative Prime Minister and Chancellor David Cameron and George Osborne when they came to power in 2010. The Conservatives back then blamed the previous Labour government. This entirely missed the point that other major developed countries and many other nations, of course, were hit by the global financial crisis. The key is in the word global, and when the crisis took a lurch for the worse in autumn 2008, the then Labour Prime Minister and Chancellor Gordon Brown and Alastair Darling did a rather good job of staving off collapse of the UK financial system. Sir Keir and his colleagues certainly have some grounds for pointing the finger at the Conservatives for their poor stewardship in the years since 2010. The Tories have presided over a miserable economic performance as a result of huge mistakes, such as their failed austerity programme and hard Brexit, and this has affected the public finances enormously and the spooking of financial markets in autumn 2022 during Liz Truss's brief spell as Prime Minister was not a good thing either. It is important, when looking at what has occurred, not just to focus on the autumn 2022 shambles, but to see the things that have caused the problems over a much longer period. Labour refuses these days even to acknowledge the huge damage being caused to the economy by the Conservatives' hard Brexit, stemming from the ending of free movement of people between the UK and the European Economic Area and loss of frictionless trade with the country's biggest trading partner. However, that does not make these colossal losses go away or render them any less real. The new UK government also looks to be telling a tale of austerity. It is certainly sticking with the Conservatives' fiscal constraints, limiting greatly its capacity to deliver major investment that could stimulate growth and boost tax revenues. Returning to the mood music, it was interesting to see the University of Strathclyde's highly regarded Fraser of Allender Institute highlight the messaging by Labour and the potential impact of this in its latest economic commentary published last week. Fraser of Allender director Professor Mari Spowage said, the new UK government has come into place in July and the new Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, has set out her view of their fiscal inheritance and the difficult decisions which may need to be made in order, as they would see it, to restore economic stability. The rhetoric around this has the potential to dent business and consumer confidence and to contribute to the softening economic performance over the summer. However, it is always difficult to definitively say that the economy is a dynamic organism rather than a predictable mechanism. Many businesses may well be waiting to see what is in the budget on the 30th of October to have the confidence to grow and invest. Fraser of Allender's commentary notes that recent UK-wide data from market research firm GFK 
reveals a decline in, in consumer confidence during July and August, with weakening perceptions of general economic conditions and the likelihood of consumers making big purchases. Douglas Farish, head of tax for Scotland for accountancy firm and Fraser of Allender commentary sponsor Deloitte, for his part, highlighted the effect of the new government's declarations on consumer confidence. And he contrasted this with an upbeat view from companies' chief financial officers in the immediate wake of the election. Mr. Farish said, Captured immediately after the general election in July, Deloitte's latest CFO survey showed signs of the UK's corporate sector gearing up for growth, with a sharp rise in CFO confidence complemented by a drop in external risk perception. Uncertainty dissipated, revenue prospects brightening in the face of a more predictable business environment. This was juxtaposed, however, by the new UK government underlining difficult economic circumstances, highlighting a £22 billion black hole exists in the public finances, with both the new Prime Minister and Chancellor warning of tough decisions to come in the October 30th budget. Perhaps unsurprisingly, recent indicators show consumer confidence has cooled as the public braces for impact. It certainly does seem that the mood of the electorate is somewhat miserable right now, and it is difficult to escape the impression that Labour has made matters worse on this front. If Sir Keir and Miss Reeves produce the type of budget of which they have been warning, you would imagine there is a good chance the mood of business and consumers will get worse still. The UK economy has been suffering a malaise for so long now, so it is little surprise that businesses and households want to see some signs of brighter times ahead. Sadly, for now, it is difficult to see better times in the short term, not because it is impossible for the new Labour government to lead us towards them, but because it has ruled out embarking on a brighter path through the choices it has made. The two big simple realities, putting aside the talk and mood music for a moment, are that Labour has tied itself up with the Conservatives' fiscal constraints and is sticking with the damaging hard Brexit. In addition to these blunders, its tone is truly confidence sapping. A more upbeat message might not shift the dial dramatically if it is not accompanied by some more adept policy making. However, it could hardly do any harm. That article was by Ian McConnell. The Herald on the 11th of October and the sports section. Fort William Ditch from UCI Mountain Bike World Series calendar by Mark McDougall. The UCI Mountain Bike World Series will not return to Fort William for the first time in more than 20 years after it's pulled from the calendar. A leg of the series has taken place at Nevis Range every year since 20, 2002, but hasn't been included in this year's event. Instead, of the UCI have decided to take the event, which is now run by Warner Brothers Discover Sports, to places such as Brazil, Italy and the USA. The Nevis Range, which has also held two world championships in the past, confirmed on social media that there would be no return of the UCI mountain bike World Series next year in a lengthy statement. The Nevis Range promised to bring new events to the area to ensure Fort William remains synonymous with mountain biking and they hope to bring the World Cup back in the future. It said it is with a very heavy heart that we announced the UCI Mountain Bike World Cup will not be returning to Fort William in 2025. While this news is deeply disappointing for us and the entire mountain biking community, we'd like to extend our heartfelt thanks to everyone involved in the last 20 years, including Event Scotland, the Highland Council and Outdoor Capital of the UK for their unwavering support over the years. The biggest thanks must, of course, go to Rare Management, whose vision, ambition and dedication brought the event to the Highlands in the first place and gave us over 20 years of World Cups and two World Championships. Fort William has long been synonymous with world-class mountain biking and while we may not be hosting the World Cup next year, 
We're incredibly excited about the new opportunities that lie ahead. In the coming weeks, we will be unveiling a series of events that promise to capture the spirit and excitement of the World Cup. These events will include four new races at Fort William to maintain the competitive edge and prestige of the World Cup. These events will bring collectively the same volume of fans and competitors, while easing the burden on local infrastructure by spreading the events over a longer period. Our focus moving forward will be on grassroots initiatives aimed at introducing new people to the sport and nurturing Scotland's next generation of elite athletes. We firmly believe that Scotland and the UK are the beating heart of mountain biking, and we are committed to ensuring that this remains the case. We wish Warner Brothers every success as they take the World Cup series forward in 2025. However, our journey with the World Cup is far from over. We're already in discussions with Highlands and Islands Enterprise, Highland Council, Events Scotland and the Scottish Government to bring the event back to Fort William in 2026 and beyond. The impact that the World Cup has had on Nevis Range, Fort William and the surrounding culture is undeniable creating a mountain biking legacy that rivals any in the world. We are immensely proud to have hosted this prestigious event for 20 years and look forward to its return. In the meantime, we will be working closely with our incredible partner, Madison, and particularly Saracen Bikes, to deliver outstanding events that bring more young people into the sport. We are dedicated to showcasing the power of biking to bring people together, enhance outdoor experiences, and build stronger communities. Looking ahead, the 2026 Commonwealth Games in Scotland presents an incredible opportunity to reignite the passion for biking in Scotland. Nevis Range is ideally positioned to host a mountain biking event such as Cross Country, ensuring that we deliver the spectacle that the entire Commonwealth will remember. We will be engaging in discussions with all the agencies involved to explore how we can turn this vision into reality. We remain committed to continuing the legacy of mountain biking in Fort William and we look forward to sharing more exciting news in the weeks to come. Speaking to our sister title, the Lochaber Times, a spokesperson for UCI Mountain Bike World Series said, Fort William will always be an iconic international mountain biking venue. Its absence from the 2025 calendar does not in any way diminish its importance but rather reflects the need to make space for other locations vying to become part of the sport's rich history. We will always be delighted to see Fort William in future calendars and we look forward to returning to an iconic venue. And that was by Mark McDougall. The Herald on the 11th of October in the sports section. Liam Scales delighted to check scoring Ireland goal off his list by Robbie Hanratty. Liam Scales isn't best known for his goal scoring exploits, yet the Celtic defender has now netted during a UEFA Champions League match for his club and bagged his first for his country within the past month. Scales 26 headed home from Liam Brady's free kick to give the Republic of Ireland a deserved equaliser in their UEFA Nations League away clash against Finland on Thursday night. Brady then grabbed a last grasp winner to seal maximum points in Group B2. Scales barely put a foot wrong throughout the 90 minutes as he relished earning just his sixth international cap. Speaking after the match, the Hoops centre-back reflected on the special moment and explained how getting onto the score sheet for Ireland had always been a personal goal. He said it's brilliant, it was a great feeling, and the fans just make it that bit better. We've been due a win, especially away from home, and when it like that was brilliant. We work hard on set pieces, and we are told to attack in between the spaces. It was just one of them that I've attacked the space and the balls arrived. It happened so quick that you were just trying to get as much good contact on it as you can direct to direct it, and luckily enough I did. I didn't get many. I've had a few season this season already. I think in the last 10 or 15 games, I've more than I had in the previous two seasons already. Droughts come as well as defender, but hopefully I can chip in with a few more. It's always been the top of the list for me, so to check that off is amazing. I'll reflect on it tonight and take it all in. 
Matchwood Abrey was also quick to praise Scales' contribution, simply stating Scales had done unbelievable to get himself a goal. On Ireland ending a three-game losing streak, Scales added, I think it will give us confidence, and I think that's been missing. We want to make a habit of winning tough games away from home, winning games at the Aviva. We want to take make it a habit. We don't want to make it a one-off. We want to become more regular. So that's the plan. We want to take the confidence into the next few fixtures and hopefully pick up as many points as we can. That was by Robbie Hanratty. The Herald on the 11th of October and the sports section. Man United Chiefs should be arrested for selling Scott McTominay by Robbie Hanratty. Manchester United should never have allowed Scott McTominay to leave the club this summer. That's according to former Celtic forward Paolo Di Canio, who believes the Red Devils hierarchy would should be arrested for selling the midfielder. McTominay had been at the English Premier League Giants since a kid and went on to make over 250 first team appearances. He even played 43 times, scoring 10 goals last season. Pretty good stats given his position. Now after sealing £25 million move to Napoli in Serie A, the Scotland international hasn't looked back. The 27-year-old has already cemented himself as key player for the Italian Giants, who topped the domestic league after seven games. So it's no wonder Di Canto is observing the situation unfold while McTominay's old club struggles and reckons offloading the player was a big mistake. I would go to those Manchester United to arrest all the directors. How can you give away McTominay? Di Canto said in an interview with Bill Matteno. McTominay scores goals, he carried the cross, he had determination, and yet they kicked him out. Nothing works at Manchester United, a club that only does stupid things. You can't guess anything. And that was by Robbie Hanratty. The Herald on the 11th of October and the Voices section. Boris Johnson on Brexit, nauseating and excruciating in equal measure by Ian McConnell. It has been a nauseating and excruciating in broadly equal measure to observe Boris Johnson trying to claim Brexit has somehow been positive, as he has done the rounds of media outlets in recent days. In an interview with radio station LBC, the former Prime Minister claimed Brexit had been a great thing. He was rather short of things with which to back up his preposterous claim, but that has not stopped him before. What we got was the usual rambunctious performance. However, it seemed telling that, when pressed by LBC presenter Nick Ferrari to give Brexit a score out of 10, he seemed reluctant indeed to do so. He qualified his answer, and it was only after he was asked if he would give it 4 or 3 out of 10, after quite a pantomime, that he went for 9. Mr Johnson gave Brexit 10 out of 10 for constitutional purity, whatever that means. He did not respond directly to the huge hit to UK gross domestic product from Brexit put by Ms Ferrari at 3.9%. Several heavyweight forecasters have estimated the impact of Brexit on UK economic outputs at a similar quantum or even greater. Mr Johnson did not engage with the presenter's point that only a small minority of people in the UK now believe that Brexit has gone well. Rather, instead of addressing the huge impact on the UK economy, the former Prime Minister favoured some whataboutery, talking about the performance of Germany and noting it was in the European Union. It was typical fare for Mr Johnson, pretty much exactly the sort of big proclamations and avoidance of the crucial economic points that we saw when he was leading the country. He declared it's 10 out of 10 for constitutional purity. Then we had this from Mr Johnson. In terms of delivering yet for the country, clearly it's going to take time before it delivers on its potential. It's been more than eight years since the Brexiteers won the June 26 referendum vote. And it's nearly four years since Mr Johnson and his government took the UK out of the single market at the end of 2020. 
he and his fellow leavers had their technical Brexit on January 31 that year. But thankfully, nothing much changed for the worse until the close of 2020. At least we had another 11 months of effectively having the huge benefits of being in the EU. In case anyone has forgotten what these benefits are, they were free movement of people between the UK and the European economic area and frictionless trading with the country's biggest trading partner. We also had this from Mr Johnson about Brexit in the LBC interview. I'd give it 10 out of 10 for what it enables to do during the pandemic, and that was the biggest problem I had during my time in government. Oh dear, clutching at straws does not even come close. Mr Johnson continued, I think the problem is not with the decision itself. It's not even with the implementation of the decision. The problem is with the use we make of it right now in the championing of Brexit. The problem, if you look at the economic and social societal damage, is clearly all about the decision itself and its implementation. Mr Johnson's jam tomorrow rhetoric about the championing of Brexit amounts to no more than hot air. And why would anyone champion a failure? This brings us nearly to another, uh, neatly to another of Mr. Johnson's interviews in recent days in which Brexit was brought up with GB News. Mr. Johnson declared in this interview that Prime Minister Sakia Starmer is, of course, seeking to reverse Brexit. This is a baffling claim. Sakia, in what seems an enormously unwise stance from an economic and societal perspective, has ruled out the UK rejoining the EU, single market, or even the customs union. It is difficult to know how much more specific he could have been about this. And it's worth noting that even if Sakia did move to take the UK back into the European single market rather than the EU, absolutely unimaginable, unimaginable as it seems, he would still not be reversing Brexit. So it is difficult to know on what Mr Johnson is basing his claim. Mr Johnson trotted out the same stuff about coronavirus vaccines in his interview with the GB News. It is all a very different story from the talk of big, brave, huge, new free trade deals that came from Mr Johnson and his fellow Brexiteers ahead of wrenching the UK out of the single market. Of course, there is no place to hide for the Brexiteers on this, although it will probably not stomp many of them continuing, uh, stop many of them continuing to try and talk a good game on the trade front. The benefits delivered by the new free trade deals agreed by the Conservatives post-Brexit with the likes of Australia and New Zealand are absolutely tiny on the Tories' own calculations. The promised US trade deal never materialised. In any case, the benefits estimated by the Conservatives when they were in power from such an agreement were also absolutely trifling relative to what has been lost in terms of UK economic output from Brexit. Sakia, for his part, continues to talk about making Brexit work and did so again as he visited Brussels earlier this month. This is an incredible notion. The Brexit damage was inevitable and it has transpired exactly as envisaged. Mr Johnson is clutching at straws as he continues to try to claim Brexit was a good thing. Yet Sakia declines to do anything significant to ameliorate the ongoing colossal damage. He is warmer in tone to the EU than the Conservatives were, and this is better than being hostile. But this amounts to a hill of beans in terms of addressing the very large, real and continuing effects of Brexit. So Keir wants to tinker around the edges of the Brexit agreement. The Prime Minister is perhaps not championing Brexit, to use Mr Johnson's own word. Maybe this is because he knows deep down the damage that Brexit is causing. He certainly argued vociferously enough against the folly when he was in opposition in late 2019. However, we must make no mistake, Sakir has fully embraced the hard Brexit delivered by Mr Johnson, something which is greatly to the detriment of the UK economy and society. That was by Ian McConnell. From the Herald Scotland, Sunday the 13th of October, from the news section, Alex Salmon dead aged 69 as former SNP leader passes away by Andrew Learmonth and Gabriel Mackay. Former First Minister Alex Salmond has died suddenly at the age of 69. 
the Alba leader collapsed at a conference in North Macedonia. According to local officials, he lost consciousness at the NX Olgika Hotel near the city of Ored at about 3.30pm local time on Saturday. Local media reports said he collapsed during a lunch and was pronounced dead at the scene. Representatives from Alba told press they believed the cause of death to be a heart attack. There were tributes from across the political spectrum. Boris Johnson described him as one of the great political disruptors of the age, while Sir Keir Stammer said he was a monumental figure. David Cameron, who was Prime Minister during the Scottish independence referendum, said Mr Salmond was a giant of Scottish and British politics. Nicola Sturgeon said her predecessor was an incredibly significant figure in my life. King Charles said he and the Queen were greatly saddened to hear of Salmon's sudden death. His devotion to Scotland drove his decades of public service. We extend our deep condolences to his family and loved ones at this time. Mr Salmon joined the SNP in 1973, allegedly after an argument with his then-girlfriend who told him if you feel like that, go and join the bloody SNP. He was the leader of the so-called 79 Group, a left-wing Republican movement which was highly critical of the incumbent party leadership and looked to shift the party's position. Mr Salmond, along with other leaders of the group, was expelled in 1982 but subsequently readmitted and, at the 1987 general election, he was elected as the MP for Banff and Buchan. He became leader of the party in 1990, defeating Margaret Ewing, but stood down in 2000 after a number of disagreements with party leaders. Following an electoral slump, he returned in 2004, taking the SNP to victory at the 2007 Holyrood election and leading a minority government for the next four years. In 2011, he and his party won a majority in the Scottish Parliament, an achievement so unlikely it was thought impossible. The victory ultimately paved the way for the 2014 independence referendum. Support for independence was as low as 32% at the time the vote was called, but by 18th of September 2014, the yes side had closed the gap significantly. One poll in the days leading up to the vote even gave independence a lead. Following the 45-55 defeat, Mr Salmon stood down as SNP leader and First Minister. In his concession speech, he quoted Ted Kennedy when he told supporters that the dream shall never die. He made a brief return to the Commons, winning the Gordon constituency in 2015 as part of an SNP landslide. He was ousted two years later when Colin Clark won the seat for the Tories at the snap election. In the weeks after his defeat, he launched his own chat show at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. It was soon picked up by the Kremlin-backed news channel RT which strained his relationship with Nicola Sturgeon. That relationship broke down completely when sexual harassment allegations came to light in 2018. Two civil servants accused him of sexual misconduct during his time as First Minister. He won a judicial review against the government's handling of the harassment complaints, with the court saying it was unlawful, unfair and tainted by apparent bias. Shortly after afterwards, he was arrested and charged with 13 offences, including attempted rape. He was acquitted of the, all the allegations following a trial at the High Court in Edinburgh. He claimed there was a conspiracy against him and that, uh, that senior figures in the Scottish Government and SNP had conspired to send him to prison. Kenny McCaskill, the former Justice Secretary, who joined Mr Salmond in Alba, said that the actions of individuals in later administrations undoubtedly took their toll upon his friend. Courts will, sit right, will still rightly decide upon the actions of individuals whose behaviour towards him was deplorable and shameful. In her tribute, Nicola Sturgeon said she cannot pretend that the events of the past few years which led to the breakdown of our relationship did not happen and it would not be right for me to try. She added, however, it remains the fact that for many years Alex was an incredibly significant figure in my life. He was my mentor and, for more than a decade, we formed one of the most successful partnerships in UK politics. Alex modernised the SNP and led us into government for the first time, becoming Scotland's fourth First Minister and paving the way for the 2014 referendum which took Scotland to the brink of independence. He will be remembered for all of that. 
My thoughts are with Moira, his wider family and his friends. First Minister John Swinney added, I am deeply shocked and saddened at the untimely death of the former First Minister Alex Salmond and I extend my deepest condolences to Alex's wife Moira and to his family. Over many years, Alex made an enormous contribution to political life, not just within Scotland but across the UK and beyond. Alex worked tirelessly and fought fearlessly for, for the country that he loved and for her independence. He took the Scottish National Party from the fringes of Scottish politics into government and led Scotland so close to becoming an independent country. There will be much more opportunity to reflect in the coming days, but today all of our thoughts are with the Alex family and his many friends right across the political spectrum. Mr Salmond is survived by his wife of 43 years, Moira. And that article was written by Andrew Learmonth and Gabriel Mackay. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 14th of October, from the Arts and Entertainment section, Overlooked, Scots poet celebrated by literary elite. Report by Caroline Wilson. Robert Burns said he had almost given up on poetry before he was introduced to his writing. The influence was so profound that it was Burns who erected a stone in Robert Ferguson's unmarked grave. The University of Glasgow was spearheading celebrations to mark the 250th anniversary of the death on October 17th, 1774, of one of Scotland's most influential, yet overlooked, poets. Writing in both Scots and English, one of Ferguson's key themes is the ordinary life of Edinburgh, and he depicts the city, warts and all, in his masterpiece, Old Reiki, which was published the year before his death. Professor Rona Brown, leading the University of Glasgow's Ferguson Project and Commemorations, emphasises Ferguson's significance. Robert Ferguson is one of Scotland's most important poets, but he is often misunderstood. Writing in both Scots and English, one of Ferguson's key themes is the ordinary life of Edinburgh, and he depicts the city, warts and all, in his masterpiece Old Reiki, 1773. His poetry is astute and satirical, funny and razor sharp. As part of the tributes, the University of Glasgow College of Arts and Humanities podcast Stories from Glasgow will offer listeners insights into Ferguson's life and work. The episode featuring Professor Brown and Dr Amy Wilcoxon, available from today, includes discussions about Ferguson's life, readings from his poetry, and explores his influence on other poets, including Robert Burns. In the podcast, Professor Brown describes Ferguson as a poet's poet who influenced writers like Robbie Burns and Robert Louis Stevenson. Noting Ferguson's profound impact on Burns, Professor Brown said, The big figure who was deeply influenced by Ferguson is Robert Burns. He was influenced by Ferguson in quite a profound way, and we know this because in Burns' autobiographical letter to Dr John Moore of August 1787, he says he had almost given up in poetry completely until he read Ferguson's poetry. It is also Burns who erects a stone in Ferguson's unmarked grave, says Professor Brown, adding, Burns erects a stone in memory of Ferguson, which describes Ferguson as Scotia's poet, and his grave is a place for people who love Scottish poetry to come and pay pilgrimage. To commemorate this, this significant anniversary, a special event, Remembering Robert Ferguson, A Night of Poetry and Music, will bring together renowned writers, musicians and academics on October 17. While tickets for this unique literary celebration have ne- now nearly sold out, The event highlights the ongoing interest in Ferguson's work and legacy. Professor Brown will be joined by special guests, including Scottish writer and broadcaster Billy Kay, acclaimed authors Andrew O'Hagan and James Robertson, musician David Hamilton and singer Kirsty McHugh, who is also a professor at the University of Glasgow. The event to honour the city's own poetic son will take place at St Cecilia's Hall in Edinburgh. Andrew O'Hagan said, For so many Scottish writers down the generations, Ferguson's voice has been part of the inner ear, a human warmth, a subtle humour and a beautiful intelligence secreted into the Scots vernacular, and I felt attentive to it all my writing life. I applaud the important work being done in Ferguson and the University of Glasgow, and I'm honoured to take part in the event at St Cecilia's to mark the 250th anniversary of his death. 
Ferguson is one of the most important figures in our literary culture and we should celebrate him at every opportunity. Billy Kay added, As an Ayrshire man steeped in the living Burns tradition, it was such a pleasure and a revelation for me to discover what Sidney Good Sir Smith called the fizzing vitality of Ferguson's poetry when I studied Scottish literature at the University of Edinburgh in the early 1970s. The love of it inspired me to produce and present a show and an iconic LP record called Ferguson's Old Rikki with a group of brilliant traditional musicians. I very much look forward to sharing my experiences with Ferguson for the audience at St Celia's Hall on Thursday. The Mitchell Library is hosting a free exhibition running until October the 30th. The event and podcast are both part of the broader initiative by the University of Glasgow, funded by the Liverholm Trust, called The Works of Robert Ferguson, Reconstructing Textual and Cultural Legacies, which aims to prepare a new edition of Ferguson's complete works for publication by Edinburgh University Press in 2026. In that article written by Caroline Wilson. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 14th of October, from the Arts and Entertainment section, Lorreen Kelly is releasing a song with Marty Pello, report by Rebecca Newlands. Lorreen Kelly is releasing a song with singer Marty Pello and a choir for a very special cause. The 64-year-old telly host will collaborate with the Wet 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 singer on a new version of the band's hit single Love Is All Around. They will be joined by a choir of women who discovered they had breast cancer after watching her chat show and all proceeds from the single will go towards Future Dreams Breast Cancer Charity. Lorraine said she plans to play the song to her baby granddaughter Billy, who was born in August. She said, 30 years ago, my daughter Rosie was born and I was listening to the song. Here we are, 30 years later, and we will be playing our version of the song to Billy all the time. So hopefully she'll be singing it. It will be the first thing that she says, which would be really nice but it sort of completes that circle. And the lyrics are so important, about love. For the last six years, ITV's breakfast programme, Lorraine, has promoted the Change and Check campaign to raise awareness of the signs and symptoms of breast cancer. Last year's single, Golden, with Joss Stone, and the Change and Check choir, went to number one in the UK singles downloads chart. Lorraine reflected on this year's charity single, It was fantastic because we were in a proper, real, true recording studio. She added, It was joyful, and the fact that we're all in it together, this amazing sisterhood along with Marty, it just felt very, very, very special. And Marty said, You will feel at the end of this something really positive and very emotional. And it really was. There were a lot of tears. Pello, former lead vocalist of Wet Wet Wet, added, We were in a place called Rack Studios, which has made so many incredible records over the years. Massive, huge selling records. It really is up there with Abbey Road. And for us to go there to to Rack Studios and capture that moment, it was a joy. More than a hundred women and one man have contacted the Lorraine programme to say that they received their diagnosis because of the campaign. The trio will perform live on Lorraine from 9am on ITV1. And that article was written by Rebecca Newlands and read by me, Eve McKenna. From the Herald, Sunday 13th of October 2024. Sports section. Hearts fan who fought to save Rangers and rid Scotland of sectarianism. By Matthew Lindsay, chief football writer. Tributes to Alex Salmon flooded in from the great and good of society on Saturday night after it was confirmed the former First Minister of Scotland had passed away suddenly from a suspected heart attack at the age of 69. After speaking at the diplomacy forum, he was attending in North Macedonia. Yet it was an online comment from a heart supporter which perhaps summed up Salmon's impact on politics in this country during the past 37 years, more eloquently than any of the praise which was lavished on him by heads of state or reigning monarchs. He did for the SNP in independence what Lawrence Shanklin did for us last season, wrote the anonymous Jambo on a fan website. 
Big Eck would have been chuffed to bits at being compared to the free scoring striker who netted 31 goals in all competitions for his beloved Tynecastle club during the 2023 24 campaign. Salmon's enthusiasm for the sport of kings, which he attributed to his uncle, urging him to place a bet on the Irish horse Arkle as a boy, was renowned. He succeeded Robin Cook, the one time foreign secretary, as a racing tipster with the Herald and appeared regularly in the Morning Line programme on Channel 4. But the Linlithgow born and raised Alba party leader was also passionate about football, not least hearts. He revealed how his allegiance had come about before the Edinburgh outfit faced their city rivals Hibernian in the Scottish Cup final at Hamden back in 2012. My dad has been supporting Hearts actively since the mid-twenties, he said, so it wasn't a matter of choice for me, it was a matter of inheritance. Salmon, who travelled to England to watch his boyhood heroes take on Wolves at Molyneux in the second leg of the Texaco Cup final the evening before he sat one of his hires in 1971 had attended three domestic cup finals before that all-capital encounter. He had seen the Gorgie side beat Kilmarnock in the League Cup final in 1962 and Rangers and Gretna in the Scottish Cup finals in 1986 and 2006. But that's not a bad record, he said. He was with his father, Robert, who was 90 at the time, sitting a couple of rows in front of him, delighted to see Hearts record their famous 5-1 triumph over Hibs on that occasion and making it a grand slam of wins. Salmon had no qualms about getting personally involved in the battle to save Hearts from the unthinkable prospect of liquidation two years later. The then First Minister spoke at the behest of Administrator Brian Jackson of accountancy firm BDO to Lithuanian politicians during a frantic race against the clock to seal a rescue deal. With cash reserves running low, he talked to the ambassador to the United Kingdom in Vilnius in an attempt to speed up the process. They were helpful conversations, he said. The people behind the eight ball here are the administrators, and like every other fan in the country, I'm hoping to see progress made. However, we know progress has been made, and we're hoping that things will reach a successful conclusion. The following month, Bidco 1874, the group fronted by businesswoman Anne Budge, took control of Heart of Melothian, PLC. And the month after that, they officially exited administration. George Fuchs, the former Labour MP and MSP who briefly served as Hearts chairman, hailed his important contribution to that outcome in X, the social media outlet, which was formerly known as Twitter, on Saturday night. This is terrible news, he wrote. He was a great help to us during difficult times when the club twice faced administration. Salmon was not so successful when he intervened in the Rangers financial crisis in 2012. However, he was quite prepared to put any personal ill feeling which he may have harboured for the Ibox club as a Hearts fan to one side in an attempt to help him secure a CVA and remain afloat. He contacted HMRC and implored them to accept both a sum to be repaid and a timescale for it to be repaid which would allow the stricken Govan outfit, who were facing a tax bill of £49 million because of their extensive use of employee benefit trusts between 2001 and 2010, to remain in business. We want Rangers to survive, he told BBC Scotland at the time. That seems to me an entirely reasonable proposition. It will allow the inland revenue to get what they are due and allow Rangers to pay their obligations, but continue as a vibrant part not just of Scottish football, but of Scottish culture. I still think that is the best way forward. I want to see Rangers continue for the next century and more, contributing to the excitement and fun of Scottish football. Can't we agree on a sum that's due and a means of paying it allows Rangers to continue as an effective functioning football club in Scotland because Scottish football, even Celtic, needs Rangers. When he informed veteran broadcaster Sir David Frost that the most die-hard Celtic supporter understands that Celtic can't prosper unless Rangers are there, in an interview on Al Jazeera television, it went down like a lead balloon in the east end of Glasgow. He had to come out and explain his comment. Major creditor HMRC rejected a CVA proposal in June of 2012 and Rangers were forced into liquidation. Salmon was also thwarted 
in his ambitions an admirable but ultimately ill-conceived attempt to rid Scottish football of the scourge of sectarianism following the old firm shame game between Celtic and Rangers at Parkhead in 2011. The visitors had three players sent off during a match which the hosts won 1-0 and there were touchline confrontations and tunnel bust up as tempers flared. There were two 34 arrests inside the stadium. Strathclyde police had vowed to crack down and drink fuel violence linked to the world famous fixture in the build up after making no fewer than 229 arrests when the Glasgow rivals had played each other the previous month. Their chief constable Stephen House called Salmon and wrote to the Scottish government urging them to convene a summit to address disorder issues surrounding the fixture. The Offensive Behaviour at Football and Threatening Communications Scotland Act came into force the following year, but the controversial and unpopular legislation was beset by problems from the outset and it was repealed by MSPs during a vote at Holyrood in 2018. Salmon, who had lost his seat in the House of Commons at the general election the years before, was far from impressed. It's totally shameful, he said. It's perfectly legitimate to say such legislation could be improved or changed in certain aspects. That is what happens as legislation beds down. Advocates of the Act have since argued that its repeal has empowered certain subsections of football fan to behave in an antisocial manner at matches. Salmond, whose reputation was, even though he was cleared of all charges against him in court in 2020, tarnished by accusations of sexual misconduct in recent years, he became something of the divisive figure later in his life. But his love of Scotland and of Scottish football could never be called into question when the national team took to the field for the first time since their Euro 2024 exit in Germany this summer to play Poland in the Nations League at Hampden last month. He joined the Tartan army in the stands with his dark blue scarf proudly wrapped around his neck. That article was by Matthew Lindsay. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 14th of October 2024, from the Voices section. Let's be honest about Salmond. What made him also destroyed him. Article written by Mark Smith. Everyone is talking about their last encounter with Alex Salmond, so I'll do it too. It was late last year. We talked on the phone a couple of times, and as it happens, we didn't discuss Scottish independence. We discussed his childhood, his views on the Scottish government, not good, his views on the UK government, not good, his love of Indiana Jones, and his thoughts on one of the Scottish politicians he admired above all others, not someone from the SNP as it happens. As usual, the former First Minister and leader of Alba was assertive and confident and caustic and articulate and knowing. He knew the game so well he'd often say, here's a quote for you, or use that quote, that's a good one. However, it struck me too, as it always did when I came across him, that his talents and skills the ones that turned him into one of the most able and extraordinary Scottish politicians of the last 100 years, were also his flaws, which is often the case with great people. What makes you also destroys you. The alpha male energy, for example. He was sometimes criticised for it, but Salmond loved the blokey atmosphere at Westminster, mostly male then and mostly male now, and his banter and style was well suited to debating chambers and pubs and loud restaurants, but less well suited to meeting rooms and TV studios when overconfident male behaviour began to be questioned much more. I remember a young colleague of mine turning up to his first conference with him and Salmond chucking a packet of sweeties on the table, the implication being, I'm the man and you're the boy. Salmond later laughed it off as a joke, but everyone knew it was calculated to make a point, and you've got to ask, who would do something like that? People who worked with Salmond, men and women, knew this alpha behaviour could sometimes be an issue. Nicola Sturgeon herself once said, when she was still talking to him, that Alex Salmond was not as funny as he thought he was, and she would later say worse things. The truth is, his talents and skills were his flaws, and his flaws were his talents and skills. Watching him in action, you could see how much his supporters and followers loved the loud, confident and jokey alpha man, and how good he was. The loyalty it inspired was also real, and not always healthy. Remember, if you must, the reaction of some of his fans when the claims of sexual assault against him first emerged in 2018, 
They were later thrown out in court. Salmon's political radar could also be very good and well-tuned to the frustration of his opponents, but to be honest, it had gone off a bit. He was spot on in thinking in 2014 that there was huge support for independence yet untapped, and he tapped it, taking it from the mid-30s to the high-40s. But he was wrong in predicting that his new party, Alba, was on the brink of a breakthrough, and he appears to have been wrong so far that the SNP need to accept a new kind of confederacy of parties and activists to advance the independence cause. His death also means any threat to the SNP's dominance of the independence movement, if it ever existed, is now even less likely than ever. And Salmond could get things wrong on independence, partly because he overestimated his own abilities. I remember him saying Brexit could have been the game-changer for independence, and that had he been in charge, support would have hit 60%. But on this, I'm afraid, it was Boris Johnson who was right, not Alex Salmond. Speaking at a book festival the other day, Johnson said that, Contrary to what the lefties said, smacking their chops, secretly hoping it would happen, Brexit did not break up the union. Which is spot on. Scott's worried that the chaos and damage seen with Brexit would be replicated a hundred times with Scottish independence, and not even Alex Salmon could convince them they were wrong. But let me tell you about one of the politicians Salmon himself admired, because it's revealing, I think. He spoke to me about him last year. John Wheatley, the Red Clyde Cider, who served in Labour's first government. As my former colleague David Torrance relates in his new book on the subject, The Wild Men, there were predictions of chaos when Labour first came to power, but the king for one was rather enamoured of Wheatley, who told him about the extreme poverty he'd faced as the son of a miner. The king is said to have told Wheatley, If I had to live in conditions like that, I would be a revolutionary myself. Salmon strongly connected to all of this, to Wheatley's story, and it was for strongly personal reasons. It was Wheatley who led the 1924 Housing Act that massively expanded council housing across the country, and Salmon saw it as the greatest achievement of that first Labour government. He also felt the positive effects of it in his own life, and told me about the council house he grew up in, which was built in the 1940s. It was brilliant, and it'll be there forever, he said. Some of the earliest social housing is some of the best in Scotland. I remember thinking, although I wouldn't want to stretch the point, that Salmon saw himself as a continuation of the tradition of politicians like Wheatley, and that he wasn't entirely wrong. What every community needs, Salmon said, is someone like Wheatley, who's part of the community and is campaigning to improve it. And Wheatley certainly did that, as far as Salmon was concerned. He was the minister who achieved the most in that first Labour government. And I think it's fair to say that, in the changed circumstances of the 21st century, Salmond could lay some claim to have connected in a similar way to a large part of Scotland. Yes, he had faded more recently, as old politicians do, and latterly he was often fated more abroad, in places like North Macedonia, than at home. Also, not even a man of his abilities could answer the persistent questions about the economic problems and cost of independence. But remember him at his height. Remember the passion and loyalty of his supporters. That didn't come from nowhere. It came from a feeling that Alec was part of one of them, authentic. As for his actual practical legacy, that is another question entirely. I would argue, as a Conservative and a Unionist, that Scotland is a more fractious and less efficient place because of the prolonged debate about independence, which was powered to a large extent by Salmon, and to that extent I do not like or appreciate what he did. But I admired him too, you know for all the qualities that were sometimes flaws and sometimes skills. The fact that he was assertive and confident and caustic and articulate and knowing. It's also significant that one of the hardest things to imagine now he's gone is who might replace him at the pinnacle of the independence movement and, most importantly, have a similar or greater effect on it. Take a look around for yourself and tell me what you think. We're going to have to wait a long, long time, aren't we? That article was written by Mark Smith and read to you by Elizabeth. From the Herald, Scotland, Monday the 14th of October 2024. From the Voices section. Salmon Dade's tears spoke volumes about sense of shock. Article written by Alison Rowett, Senior Politics and Features Writer. Parliaments have their own ways of marking the death of a member. Protocols are observed, some dating to an earlier age, others less so. 
As it is for legislatures, so it is for the media. While its methods may be more modern, certain rules still apply. Most people will have heard about the death of Alex Salmond via a notification on their phone or via a breaking news alert online or on television. After that initial summons to attention, the tribute to the former First Minister of Scotland began to flow on social media. From the King and the Prime Minister to the current First Minister and ex-First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, it seemed everyone wanted to have their say. Some were quicker off the mark than others, as though it were a race. Hour after hour, the tributes continued, the hashtags changing, but the sense of shock remaining steady. After that, the newspapers and websites took over, and then the Sunday politics shows. The 24-7 media machine was working as it should, packaging and processing the material. A man's life reduced to a package of clips and a clutch of quotes. Early as it is, hundreds of thousands of words have already been expended, all of them trying to capture the moment and convey a feeling. Yet nothing has been as powerful as the last few seconds of an interview on BBC Scotland's The Sunday Show. As the presenter Gary Robertson said in his introduction, this was a very different programme than the one that had been planned. A balance had to be found between paying tribute to Mr Salmond while acknowledging the difficulties of later years. The same was required of every media outlet, yet there was always going to be a particular attention paid to the BBC's coverage. Such was the fraught relationship between Mr Salmond and the corporation. His last dealings with BBC Scotland had been over the recent two-part series Salmon and Sturgeon, A Troubled Union. He was scornful of the film, feeling it had reduced his political partnership with Miss Sturgeon to the stuff of soap opera and accusing the BBC of a venomous and institutional bias against independence. For any independent supporter to trust a single word the BBC or associated organisations say is one of the great mistakes in life, he wrote on Twitter slash X. After a brief look at Mr Salmon's life and career, and an interview with John Swinney, Robertson spoke to former MP Joanna Cherry KC and Jeff Aberdeen, ex-chief of staff to the former First Minister. Mr Aberdeen, pale and still in shock, looked like a man who had had a long, bleak night. But he had turned out to pay tribute to his old boss because it was the right thing to do. As the presenter Gary Robertson brought the interview to a close, Mr Aberdeen could hold the emotional line no longer and broke down. It was a very human moment, a natural and understandable response to the death of someone close. The two had their differences. Mr Salmond sacked his chief of staff no less than seven times, but that was Alec, never Alex, to those who knew him best. Alec was complicated. The term is mine, not Mr Aberdeen's. My contribution to the mountain of euphemisms that had built up by morning's end. Others spoke of Mr Salmond as a divisive figure, or were keen to stress the distance between them, even while paying tribute. We had our differences, was a familiar refrain. For a politician rightly credited as one of the most polished media performers of his generation, Mr Salmon's ability to make himself understood appeared to have deserted him in recent years. That is one view. His supporters might argue that circumstances and other factors conspired to rob him of a fair hearing, then and since. It is an argument that will continue for many years to come, and indeed may never be settled now that one of the central figures has departed. On Sky News' Sunday with Trevor Phillips, the presenter was one of many journalists keen to pay tribute to Mr Salmond as a formidable interviewee. He had been booked to appear on the show next week. We were bracing ourselves for a tough one, said Phillips, before going on to say that today's politicians could learn from studying Mr Salmond's parliamentary career. The Sky News presenter is not the first and won't be the last to hold Mr Salmond up as an example to others. The former First Minister was part of a talented generation of politicians. Blair, Brown, Kennedy, Forsyth, take your pick, the likes of which some fear will never be seen again. Different individuals, but with things in common. Chief amongst them, a hinterland and a healthy reverence for parliamentary democracy. Mr Salmond was a showman and proud of it. He also had a sense of humour, a commodity much lacking in modern politics. Brian Cox, a guest on BBC One's Sunday with Laura Kunzberg,
had no hesitation in comparing some of today's politicians with Mr Salmond and finding them wanting. One in particular, fellow guest and Tory leadership contender Robert Jenrick, was described by the succession actor as having a head full of mints. Given Mr Jenrick's record as a minister included ordering a cartoon mural at an asylum centre to be painted over, it was hard to disagree. He now regrets this, we were told. Elsewhere on the Sunday shows, one would like to have known what Mr Salmon thought of the performance of Jonathan Reynolds, the UK business secretary who was busy trying to argue that the transport secretary Louise Haig did not speak for the government in calling for a boycott of P&O ferries. On this and many other subjects, Mr Salmond would have had an opinion and expressed it well. But talk of the new Labour government's investors' summit starting Monday, asylum centres, leadership contenders talking nonsense. It was all a reminder that politics stops for no one. The caravan moves on regardless. That article was written by Alison Rowett and read to you by Elizabeth. From the Herald Scotland, Monday 14th of October 2024. From the STEM section of the business section. Fostering the future of life sciences in Glasgow. Article by Mark Hanna. There is an unmet need for better precision medicine globally. Patients won't always respond to mass prescribed treatments, resulting in unnecessary side effects and wasted prescriptions, but precision medicine will help optimise patient treatment pathways and Glasgow can be home to life-changing innovations. When considering locations for health and technology investment, there are attractive options across the UK and Europe, But Glasgow, with world-class research institutions and one of the largest acute hospitals in Britain, has firmly established itself as a hub for biotech, medtech and precision medicine. These fields are crucial to the future of healthcare. This strong academic foundation, coupled with a robust talent pool and the Scottish Government's life sciences strategy, makes the city a prime destination for innovation and investment. Glasgow's new purpose-built life science facility, Health Innovation Hub, High H, which CADAN's science partner is delivering in collaboration with the Living Laboratory, will cement its reputation as a science cluster and deliver real impact on precision medicine. The innovation, creativity and technology Glasgow has produced over centuries is enviable. But we need the infrastructure, support and funding to attract startups and scale-ups emerging from the city's universities to develop here instead of the Golden Triangle in South East England or overseas. Since the west of Scotland Science Park is currently at capacity, with inspiring businesses like Reprocell, which use human data to improve drug development, we understand strong demand exists here. As a native Scot, I'm proud to be back in Glasgow, not only developing here, but contributing to a community where people want to live and work. We are leveraging its existing talent and infrastructure, creating spaces that meet the current demands, while also nurturing partnerships and contributing to a thriving life sciences ecosystem in Scotland. What makes projects like High H so exciting for me is the prospect of who might establish and develop their technology there. We've secured the Digital Health Validation Lab, a partnership between University of Glasgow and NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde as the first tenant. This lab will provide essential digital health technology expertise to help innovators deliver high-impact solutions for clinical use, which will be transformative for industry. When creating a purpose-built facility, we can design with flexibility in mind to support the growth of our tenants and meet the strict sector requirements and compliance regulations. Working in collaboration with Glasgow City Council, University of Glasgow and other stakeholders ensures our projects align with the needs of the community, but are designed to adapt at scale, boosting future growth. This project goes beyond bricks and mortar. We are committed for the long haul, 
ensuring our facilities meet the needs of today and support the city's growth as a global life sciences leader. We aim to bridge the gap between construction and science, ensuring development milestones are hit on schedule and the smooth transition of our assets to fully operational spaces that foster innovation and collaboration. Together we have a unique opportunity to be at the forefront of life-changing precision medicine, driven by collaboration, innovation and investment. It's a very exciting and bright future. And that article was written by Mark Hanna, who is Director of Asset Management at Cadan's Science Partner. From Herald Scotland, Monday 14th October 2024. From the STEM section of the business section. Sea trials of Calmac Ferry fiasco ship, an overall success. Article by Craig Williams. Trials of a late and over budget ferry have been an overall success, a shipbuilding company has said. The MV Glen Sanex has successfully completed a number of sea acceptance trials after construction work was completed at the Ferguson Marine Yard in Port Glasgow, in Verclyde. It comes after a blackout caused by a power cut on the vessel led to another delay on Thursday, October the 3rd. On Friday, Ferguson Marine sent a letter to Sir Edward Mountain, Conservative MSP and convener of the Scottish Parliament's Net Zero Energy and Transport, NZET committee, stating a number of sea trials that took place between Tuesday and Thursday this week had gone to plan. The letter, sent by the shipbuilder's interim CEO, John Pettigrew, says the trials include testing the ship's steering and manoeuvring, speed, stopping, thrusters, noise and vibration. They also included testing of unmanned machinery space, UMS, and endurance. The shipbuilders have said they will provide the NZET committee with a handover date as soon as it is confirmed. It adds, We are pleased to report that the trials were an overall success. Additionally, we have fully resolved the setup of the fire and gas detection system. Two successful LNG, liquefied natural gas, bunkerings were also carried out and the LNG tank level alarms were tested and approved on Saturday. Although further work is ongoing, we will provide the committee with a definitive handover date as soon as it is confirmed. And that article was written by Craig Williams. This is from the Herald Scotland of Tuesday the 15th of October 2024 from the business section. Entrepreneur sets out bright vision for central Scotland. This article is by Caroline Wilson. A Scottish entrepreneur who started making candles as a distraction after a life-changing diagnosis has set out her bright vision to become central Scotland's market leader. Karen Graham was leading a full and active life with husband Chris and their two teenage children when she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis out of the blue in June 2022. The incurable condition affects the brain and spinal cord with some of the most common symptoms including fatigue, blurred vision, numbness, balance issues, muscle cramps, and memory issues. The illness had a big impact on their family life, but the mother of two found a therapeutic outlet that they could all get involved in, and within six months had turned it into a business that now boasts clients, including Stirling Castle. Having always enjoyed arts and crafts, Karen and and husband Chris, also 44, started making candles on the kitchen table at their home in Stirling. Seeing the positive impact it had on the whole family, the couple pondered taking their occasional hobby to the next level. The couple founded the Stirling Candle Company in January 2023, 
providing a range of luxury scented candles with names including Fresh Start, after sourcing the training and materials they needed just a few miles away in Falkirk-based business Candle Shack. Now boasting more than 20 scent varieties, tens of thousands of social media followers, and a diary jam-packed with events and local markets, the mother of two says she is extremely proud of what they have achieved in such a short space of time. She says the wholesale business took off surprisingly quickly and they now supply to tourist hotspots including the gift shop at the Wallace Monument which welcomes more than 100,000 tourists each year. Chris and I both still work. The children are teenagers and now I am living with MS, she said. It's a lot to take on. But during such a dark time for our family, candle making and then the business has really brought light into our lives. At the moment, we are still building up the business, but eventually we would like our business to be Central Scotland's leading candle and home fragrance supplier. That's our vision. Our products are really high quality, not like something you would buy in the supermarket. All our ingredients are local and sustainability is a big thing for us. We don't use parabens and everything is environmentally friendly, including the glitter, which is biodegradable, added the businesswoman, who works in the NHS, while her husband's background is in IT. When I was diagnosed, my mental health really took a turn for the worst, she said. I felt like I was in a very dark place and I really didn't know what the future held for me. Candle making gives me something to work towards and look forward to each day. It gives me a sense of purpose. I always say to people, the studio we created is my happy place because I go out there and put my tunes on and Chris is at the other side of the table getting everything boxed up. Initially, doctors suspected Karen's neurological symptoms were labyrinthitis and started treatment. But when her condition didn't improve, she was hospitalised again with a suspected Bell's palsy. When we got the MS diagnosis, it was a lot to process and a massive change for me overnight, she said. Some days I wake up and my legs just won't work. Other days I'm extremely tired and it's affected my balance a lot as well. I can't really walk very far and it can be quite dangerous going out on my own. I've just always tried to stay positive. Hopefully others see that. When you get a, a diagnosis like MS, your life has not ended. Cheryl McLean, co-founder of Candle Shack, said, Karen's story is an inspiring one. Karen and Chris have built an amazing business in a very short space of time and it's amazing to see something so positive and purposeful emerge from such a difficult situation. We support thousands of people from hobbyists to large manufacturers and it's stories like Karen's that make it extra special. That article was by Caroline Wilson. This is from the Herald Scotland of Tuesday the 15th of October 2024 from the business section. Stunning estate on North Coast 500 tourist route for sale. This article is by Brian Donnelly. A Scottish estate on a world famous tourist route has been brought to market. The stunning location is adjacent to the North Coast 500 and has a traditional style lodge, cottage and bothy with potential to develop a tourism-related business. Land for Chartered Land and Forestry Agency said the estate has outstanding brown trout fishing on Loch Uragil, Cam Loch and the Leadmore and Leadbeg rivers and red deer stalking and rough shooting opportunities. Land for said Leadmore Lodge Estate extends to 210.02 hectares or 518.96 acres in a very accessible and stunning area of Sutherland near Elfin in the northwest highlands. The surrounding area is the most sparsely populated corner of Europe and the geology is amongst some of the oldest in Britain. 
The stone-built properties on the estate are positioned at the eastern end of the estate, with far-reaching views south and west over the Ledmore River towards the mountain peaks in the distance. The former lodge and nearby shepherd's cottage are surrounded by areas of garden ground, partly enclosed by old stone walls and fences, and screened from the main road to the north and east by an established shelter belt of Scots pine and mixed broadleaves, creating privacy. The agent also said, The county of Sutherland is known for its beautiful coastline and stunning, rugged countryside, from the fertile straths to the dramatic mountain ranges. The region enjoys continued growth and yet retains its unspoilt charm and sense of community. Landfor said the freehold is available at offers over 700,000. That article was by Brian Donnelly. That concludes this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and to tell your friends about our service.